Good day to you. I count it a great privilege to bring you the Word of God via this platform. I'll be speaking on the topic, Excellence Without Compromising the Message. Shall we pray? Almighty Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to bring your Word. I pray this Word will profit every era, and above all, it will profit your kingdom. I pray for utterance and unction. Thank you, faithful Father. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray it. One more time, the topic is excellence without compromising the message. Let's begin with a definition which I drew out from the dictionary. My dictionary defines the word excellence as a state or quality of being outstanding or superior. Now, some wise men spoke and I drew out three of their sayings. The first person is a man known as B.C. Forbes, a U.S. publisher. This man said, there is more credit and satisfaction in being a first-class truck driver than being a 10th class executive. Think about that. Another one said, that's Lord Chesterfield, a British statesman. He said, whatever is worth doing at all is worth doing well. Saying this, I smiled that the man merely echoed what is written in the ancient words of God. He drew this from the precious word of God, the scriptures. Remember, Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. Beloved, this call is to everyone, that whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Invest everything you have into it. In other words, do it excellently. Now, in only six days, God made the firmaments, he made the waters, he made the trees, he made the birds, he made the seas, he made the fishes, he made animals, he made many other things. At the end of each day of creation, I discovered that God looked at what he had made. He saw that it was good. You take note that in verse 4, the Bible saw the light, that it was good. In verse 10, the land and seas were good. In verse 12, the vegetation was good. Verse 18, you discover that the sun, the moon, and the stars were good. Verse 21, the fishes and birds were good. Verse 25, the terrestrial animals that God created, he saw that they were good. And this led us into the final stage of creation, when God's creation reached a climax with the creation of man. In verse 27, the Bible says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Just after creating man, the first set of words God released unto man was a blessing. Verse 28, the Bible says, God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the herd, subdue it, and have dominion. This is the five-fold mandate God gave to man just after creating man. At the end of it all, God now looked at everything he had made. Now he saw and acknowledged the fact that it was not just good, but very good. As a matter of fact, in verse 31 of Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says, Behold, it was very good. I love the way the Living Translation renders this verse. It says, Then God looked over all that he has made, and it was excellent in every way. God is an excellent creator, better put, God is the excellent creator. But take note, after God had created man, there was one more thing he needed to do. And God did not shy away from doing this. Genesis 2, 7, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. At creation, what we discover is this, God invested three great things in man. Number one, is craftsmanship. You take note that when God was going to create other things, he merely commanded them into being. Let there be light. Let there be fishes. Let there be the firmament. Let there be. Let there be. That was the language. But when it was time to make man, he said, let us make man in our own image. And God sat down to form man out of the dust of the heart. So man is so precious and special to God. So man is not a product of mere command. He was a product of God's craftsmanship. God took his time to make you. 
Number two investment God made into man is his image. Let us make man in our own image. So he made us to look like him. So no man can look at me and say, I am ugly. It's not arrogance. You know why? I resemble my father. Beloved, you are not ugly. You are not inferior because you are in the image of God. If anyone looks at you and says you don't amount to anything, the person does not understand scripture because a person whom God formed, who looks like God, cannot be nothing. You are not a non-entity. The third thing is his nature. God breathed into man himself. He breathed into man himself, his very nature. And the fact is this, when God breathed the breath of life into man, what he did was to transfer his very nature. That is everything that makes God, God, he poured into man, including that nature of excellence. It is a benevolent gift from God. We must be excellent too. This is why my watchword as a servant of God is this, if it must be done, then it must be done well. Now, after creating man, God subjected Adam to the first text, test of excellence. Genesis 2.19 says something. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. Take note of those words, to see. God brought them to Adam to check out what he would call them. The verse goes on to say, And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. You know what that means? It means that God had on his mind a set of names. He merely brought these animals to Adam to see what we will call them. And whatever he called them, that was the name thereof. Thereafter, that was the name. So meaning Adam passed this test of excellence. I pray for you. You will not fail any test God puts before you in the name of Jesus. Now, I've discovered in life, there are three categories of people in life. Using the analogy of the game of football, number one, those who do not care. These are the neutrals who do not care about football at all. Bring a football match to their backyard. They do not watch it. Place it on television live before them. They are not interested. They just don't care about football. Number two category of people are those who watch things happen. These are spectators who go to the stadium to watch the match or even stay back home and watch it on TV. This one will never allow any football match to go. They are just keenly interested. These are the ones you call ardent football watchers. Some have grown to the category of addicted football watchers. These are the ones who watch things happen. Then the third category are those who make things happen. Wonderful. These are footballers who actually play the game. These are the ones who actually receive the prize. These are the ones who actually collect the awards. These are the ones who actually earn big remuneration. So three categories, the neutrals. Then you have the newsmakers. I call the neutrals the noisemakers. They are neutrals, but they can talk and condemn if they want. <laughs> then we have the news, news watchers. These ones watch things happen. But then we have the newsmakers. These are the ones who make things happen. These are the people in the category of excellent people on earth. Now, quickly, let's move a step forward. What are the catalysts of excellence? I guess you are asking. There are three key elements that engender, that encourage, that bring about excellence in life and ministry. I'm dividing the three into this. One, behavioral elements. Two, technical elements. Three, spiritual elements. Quickly, let's look at the first one, behavioral elements. This has to do with your thought pattern, your attitudes and your actions. Under this, we look at one, you must realize that God created you for a purpose. Discover the purpose and pursue it. You discover that Satan has a purpose. The Bible says in John 10, verse 10, the A part, the thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus equally has a purpose. The B part of that same verse, John 10, 10 says, I am come that they might have life, and what? And that they might have it abundantly. First John chapter 3, verse 8, the B part makes me understand that for this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. For this purpose. 
So it is unfortunate if a man lives through life without discovering the purpose for which you were sent. Take note, God did not invest so much in creating you and have no plan for your existence. No. Every man is born for a reason and for a season. It is your duty to realize this and find out why the Creator made and donated you to the world. Why are you here now? And there is a basic fact I've discovered about life as well. In science, they taught me that matter is anything that has weight and occupies space. Am I correct? Of course, science students in the house there will know. Matter is anything that has weight and occupies space. In life, if you merely occupy space in the world without exerting any weight on your world and even your generation, then you do not matter. I pray you will matter for God and you will matter for your generation in the name of Jesus. Number two, acquire relevant knowledge. By this I mean you should read good books, especially the Bible. The Bible is a storehouse of divine wisdom for everything man can think of. Browse the internet for edifying stuffs. This is not the time to waste your time browsing through the Facebook and reading stories and watching pictures that do not add any value to your life. I often tell people, it's better to face your book than wasting your time on Facebook. Because when you don't face the book and you merely chat away on Facebook, then you cannot be in the book that people can face and read in the future. Browse the internet for defined stuffs. Attend seminars, godly ones, good ones, clean ones that will help your mind. Engage in critical appraisals, be observant, ask questions, accept criticisms. Number three, still under this uh, behavioral elements, work diligently. Now, the dictionary calls mediocrity, neither very good nor very bad. It is unfortunate that in life, a lot of people leave the bus stop of failure, but they never get to the destination of excellence. They often alight at the bus stop of mediocrity. So unfortunate. And why is this so? It is because of laziness. Proverbs 21, 25 says, The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. Proverbs 22, 29 says, Seest thou a man diligent in his business, he shall stand before whom? Kings. He will not stand before mean men. Hallelujah. In John chapter 5, verse 16, the Bible says, Our Lord, I mean, our Lord Jesus says, My Father worketh either too, and I work. That's Jesus, our Savior, our perfect example. Saying, My Father worketh either too, and I work. James 2.26 says, Faith without works is dead. Beloved, laziness is not a virtue of Christianity. It's not a virtue that one can boast of. You should be hardworking. You should be diligent workers if you truly want to be excellent. Number five under this, pay attention to details. This is the ability to achieve thoroughness and accuracy when accomplishing a task. In other words, crossing the T's and dotting the I's. Examples of this include proofreading write-ups. When you write an article, when you write a material, take your time to proofread. This is what we mean by giving attention to details. Check up the facts before releasing them. When you shoot a movie, make sure you go for clean pictures and sound qualities. Don't release to the world what is ugly. Don't release what is wishy-washy. When you produce a music, Balance all instruments and parts in that musical piece before releasing it to the world. When you want to speak, improve your speaking skills. These are the things we talk about when we talk of paying attention to, to details. This is where a lot of people miss it. Unfortunately, in this part of the world where I am, a lot of us do not pay attention to details. We just do things. That's why you find a building so beautifully constructed after just a few months, what do you discover? It's dilapidated. No attention to details. People don't care whether the things goes down, whether it's ugly or terrible. But when you are one that gives attention to details, you want to maintain finesse. You want things to come out crisp and clean. This is one of the attributes of excellence. Still under this point, associate with excellence-minded people. Remember Proverbs 27 verse 17. Iron sharpened iron. So a man sharpened the countenance of his friend. 
And the Bible goes on to say in Proverbs 13, 20, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Beloved, if you truly want to lead an excellent life, you must associate with excellence-minded people. Identify and get close to truly excellence-minded people. Appreciate them. Study them. Listen to them. Ask questions. Let's move on to the second element. That's the technical elements. Technical elements. To be excellent in any field of human endeavor, you need to develop the necessary technical know-how and skills. Any field, be it engineering, entertainment, law, education, medicine, marriage, and even ministry, requires proficiency. You must discover the necessary skill for, to, for whatever career, profession, or ministry pursuit God has placed in your hand. Go for the technical skill. Learn about it. Don't merely say, I have the experience. You must improve. As a drama minister, I read books a lot. I try my hands on all manner of things. During the period of lockdown that happened around the world, it was not a lockdown for me. God allowed it to unlock a lot of hidden treasures in me, which I'm now engaged in that are really helping me in my ministry pursuit. Beloved, develop your technical proficiency. Number three, spiritual elements. These are the most important elements because without God, inspiration would be lacking. And without divine inspiration, excellence remains a mirage. Under this, number one, have a renewed mind. Remember Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The first point under the spiritual element is a renewal of your mind. Your mind must be renewed. It's just like you have a laptop that you got from somewhere. Somebody gave it to you as a gift. I must assure you that if you really want to make the best of that laptop, you will need to format it so that you can put the things you want in that laptop that will suit your purpose. For God to infuse the spirit of excellence in you, the first step is that there must be a renewal of mind. And this begins with the step of salvation. Beloved, I'm not releasing a motivational talk here. I'm talking of spiritual matters. Hey, I can say all manner of things. If I don't tell you this, then I'm not telling you the truth. It begins with the renewal of your mind. Then God can really allow everything he has deposited in you at creation to come to the fore. Number two under this, pray for divine inspiration. To manifest God's divine nature of excellence, you must follow the admonition in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. There the Bible says, Stir up the gifts of God, which is in thee. Stir it up. This happens mainly by divine inspiration. God is the one that can stir up. Whereas you want to stir up, allow God to infuse his inspiration into you. Remember Job 32, verse 28 says, But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. So God is the one who can truly inspire. I can tell you a thousand and one examples of how I have received this divine inspiration as a drama minister. Wonderful scripts have come forth that I never thought of. Just products of grace, purely from heaven. When you are in place and you are willing, He is always ready and willing too to release. Number three, be totally focused. Philippians 3, 13 to 14 says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before. And verse 14 says, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This one thing I do, this is the secret of excellence. Not of caution. Do not be a jack of all trades and master of none. That's the truth. You can be good in a lot of things. But the fact is this, you must be totally focused to one particularly. There are people that can play all, play all manner of instruments. They can equally preach very well. These ones can draw. They can write. These people can even produce movies. They can write wonderful books. But then the truth is this, this one thing I do. There must be something that people know as your calling. 
Now, what readily comes to your mind when I mention the following names? Reynard Bonke. I'm sure what will come to your mind is world evangelism. If I mention E.A. Adeboe, what comes to your mind? Of course, you know of a pastor whom God is using around the world. And if I mention Domwen, oh, that's a world-class gospel singer doing so well for the kingdom of God. If I mention Lionel Mercy, I'm sure you'll think of football. If I mention Mike Bamiloe or even Shola Mike Agbola, what comes to your mind? Movie making, drama ministry. This is the way it should be. Let's start to say we cannot do other things. But there is one center focus. There is one fulcrum on which our life and ministry hang. So be totally focused. Don't run around, touch this a little, leave it. Look for another one, touch it a little, leave it. No, be focused on one thing and see yourself grow by the grace of God in that particular thing. Number four, under this, do not fear. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. God did not give us a spirit of fear. He gave us out of power, love, and of a sound mind. Beloved, you want to operate on this uh, frequency of excellence. I challenge you, dear the impossible. Grab the intangible. For all things are possible with God. So do not fear. When God places it on your heart, go ahead, do it. And I must add here, do not be afraid of even failure. Because failures are the wrongs on the ladder that leads to success. Don't be afraid of failure. Don't be afraid of people laughing at you or mocking at you. Hey, the laughers become the testifiers of the grace of God in your life in a short while. You just keep at it. Keep at it, beloved. Still under this, number five, humility. James 4, 6 says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he seeth. God resisted the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Hey, if God helps a man, that man is helped. But if God resists you, then one is in trouble. Listen, the scripture says, Wherefore God resisted the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. The most subtle killer of grace in man is pride. Avoid it. For the Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 27, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. So you must always realize that whatever level of grace you manifest, there is a giver of it. And that's God. Don't allow him to resist you. When God begins to use you mightily, locally, globally, always remember that God is the giver of it. Don't begin to boast around. Oh, just take it that it is God that gave it and you must remain humble. Number six, under the spiritual element, avoid compromise. It is sad to note that many talented Christians have drifted into the world and these ones are now using their God-given talents to serve and honor the devil. If I have to mention names which is not necessary in this teaching, I'll be able to mention at least five names that I know readily that started as musicians in the church. But little by little, they drifted into the world. They are now singing in clubhouses, singing to the glory of the devil. Oh, I love Jesus. I stand to baby, I love you. Oh, oh, Jesus, I can go all the way for you. As come to baby, I can, I, can, I, I can catch a grenade for you. Oh, what a wonderful uh, beginning they had. But now the commentary is so bad. They began with God and now they are dedicated to the devil. Compromise. Some of the few remaining in the church believe the grass is greener on the other side. Whereas it is mere as matters. They believe those in the secular world are really making it. <laughs> hey, when you get close to them, you discover that what they are doing is mere showmanship, show off, to package themselves. The man that received just a token on location as a movie maker, we tell you he's paid in millions hey, to increase his worth. Whereas the innocent man in the church making movies for God, we'll be tempted to believe that the grass is greener on the other side. And I've discovered at times that the grass is not really green on, greener on the other side. It depends on the screen through which you are looking. Maybe it's a green screen that is green, and you think the other side is green. When you get there, you discover you have been deceived. You will not be deceived in Jesus' name. Avoid compromise. Some are borrowing and copying ungodly ideas from the secular world to do the work of God. This is compromise. You cannot do the holy work 
Hey, with unholy ideas, you can't. Remember 2 Corinthians 6, 14 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Beloved, we cannot be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Holy works must be done with holy hands. I bring us a challenge as I begin to close from the life of Daniel. You remember Daniel and his colleagues had had every opportunity to compromise their stand in Babylon. But they chose the path of honor by refusing to compromise. Daniel 1.8 says, But Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the priest of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. It's a determination. You make up your mind, I'm not going to compromise. I will stand on the path of righteousness. When the question comes, who is on the Lord's side? I'll be the first person to raise my hand. I am on the Lord's side. When the question comes, will you also go away? I'll be the first one to say, Lord, to whom will I go? So this is the language of one who is not willing to compromise. Take a challenge from the life of Daniel. In the end, Daniel had a testimony. Daniel 6.3, the Bible says, Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. After he had refused to compromise in chapter 1, one will think he will lose his position. But the next we see about him in chapter 6, verse 3, is that he was preferred above all others, including those who decided to compromise. Why? An excellent spirit was found in him. And what happened? The king set him over everyone in the kingdom, in the realm. And this is my final charge at this point. It is important to sound a note of caution. In the drive for excellence, we must be careful not to drift into compromise. As we propagate the gospel, the method can change, but the message remains the same. The means can change, but the meaning remains the same. The script can be improved, but the scripture remains the same. The song can sound better, but the spirit must not be lost. The preaching can be eloquent, but the power must not be missing. We can be excellent without being excessive. I pray for you. You will not be a waste to the kingdom of God. Thank you for your time. The Lord bless you. Amen.